We are going to take a little trip down memory lane in this video. We're going to look at the different models of the atom uh, that kind of existed, and then as we discovered new things, kind of how our understanding of the atom has changed. So something to understand here is that uh, there were a lot of scientists that contributed to our understanding of the atom here. Uh, and you can even see here, just looking at these three pictures at the top, uh, our idea of what the atom looks like has changed over time. So there was a lot of discoveries and a lot of people involved, uh, you know, anywhere here from like 1800s to 1930s. Again, you don't need to know the years, uh, but definitely, as you already can tell, uh, there were experiments here and, you know, a lot of people involved in this. So we're going to look at the different models of the atom that existed and see where we are today. So our first model of the atom is Dalton's model. Uh, and if you remember back to Dalton's atomic theory, he basically said that, you know, atoms were tiny, indestructible particles. There was nothing inside. Remember, uh, he didn't know about the subatomic particles, protons, neutrons, electrons. So Dalton basically just thought the atom was a circle. So it's perhaps the easiest model of the atom to draw and remember. Uh, so if you were, you know, drawing Dal Dalton's model of the atom here, you would just have to draw a circle, okay? Um, that's all you have to do, basically, for his model of the atom. Again, you don't need to know the years, but you should have a basic understanding of each of the models and what they would look like. So Dalton's is the easiest. But remember here, they were doing experiments, making discoveries as time went on. So as things are discovered, we have to kind of change our model of the atom. So Thompson comes along, and if you remember from the cathode ray experiment, Thompson discovered electrons. So now we need to have electrons in our model of the atom. We can't just have a circle anymore because we know about these subatomic particles. Uh, so the idea here is that um, we know that the atom itself has no charge, but then Thompson discovered these negatively charged electrons. So in order to balance out that negative charge, they didn't know about protons. So what they said was that yeah, these negatively charged electrons, and then the rest of the atom just kind of has this positive nature to it, okay? It's not protons, it's not a nucleus or anything like that, it's just that the rest of the stuff of the atom is positive, and that balances out the negative electrons. That's the only way we would get a neutral atom. So the easiest way to show this, all right, draw your atom, you show your negative electrons being present, you draw them as a negative with a circle, all right, that indicates that they're a particle, that they're an electron. And then what you do is you just say, okay, the rest of this inside stuff is just positive. All right, and that balances out the negative charge. But there are no protons. We're not circling the positives to indicate they're a particle. Uh, so this uh, picture over here is a really good representation of what Thompson's model of the atom looked like. We call it the plum pudding model. Uh, plum pudding actually has no uh, plums in it at all. Uh, so the easiest way I always say to explain this, if you want to understand Thompson's model of the atom, uh, imagine you had some vanilla pudding. Imagine you added some, you know, M&Ms to that pudding. The vanilla pudding part would be your positive stuff, and then the M&Ms would be your negatively charged electrons. So that's a good understanding of Thompson's model of the atom with these negative electrons and the rest of the atom kind of just being this positive nature. This brings us to Rutherford's model of the atom. If you remember from the gold foil experiment, Rutherford discovered that the atom is mostly empty space and that there's a dense, positively charged nucleus in the center of the atom. So now our model of the atom has to incorporate these ideas. So the easiest way to draw Rutherford's model here, you draw your positive nucleus in the center. All right, from here on out, all these models of the atom we're gonna see that are left always have a positively charged nucleus in the center of the atom. That is completely correct. Rutherford's experiment proved that, and it still holds up. So we know that the positive nucleus is in the center with the protons and the neutrons, and then most of the atom is empty space, but the electrons are outside of that. We know the electrons exist because of Thomson, but the electrons are outside of the nucleus, and they are moving around the nucleus uh, all over the place. So this becomes kind of like the Jimmy Neutron model of the atom when you're drawing it. Basically, they show the electrons kind of just moving all over the place here outside of the uh, nucleus. So they're kind of just going every which way all around the nucleus. So if you look here at this picture on the left, this center 
should be labeled as positive. That would be your positively charged nucleus with your protons and your neutrons. And your electrons here are in blue, and they are moving around. Okay, they should all be labeled as negative. They're moving around the nucleus every which way. Um, but remember here, the atom is mostly empty space. Some of these things are drawn a little bit bigger so you can see them, uh, but the atom is mostly empty space. So this is a good representation of Rutherford's model. Uh, even though you know the nucleus is correct, and this is a pretty good idea of what an atom looks like, we knew that this was not the final model here because his model did not explain the chemical properties of elements. Uh, when elements are uh, burned or when they're given energy, uh, something happens here, and this model of the atom does not explain that. So they knew there was more kind of uh, to this picture here, more to our understanding of the model of the atom. But this is a pretty good idea. Positive nucleus in the center with your protons and neutrons, all right? Most of the atom is empty space, but the electrons are moving around the nucleus kind of every which way, uh, and you need to make sure that uh, you're you're showing those electrons, labeling them as negative, labeling your positive nucleus, knowing where things are. But this is not going to be the final model of the atom. So Bohr comes along here, and he adds to Rutherford's model. Basically, Bohr says that these electrons are not just moving every which way outside of the nucleus. They're actually moving in a circular orbit. If you think about what it means to orbit something, it just means you're going around and around and around. Uh, but they're also at fixed distances from the nucleus. So to draw this one, all right, you have your positive nucleus in the center, just like Rutherford said, that's always going to be there. Your protons and neutrons are in the center. Uh, but the electrons are not just going to be moving every which way around the outside of the nucleus, like Rutherford said. Uh, Bohr is saying here that the electrons are actually going to be moving in specific orbits at fixed distances from the nucleus. So basically it ends up looking kind of like a bullseye here, all right? These electrons are kind of circling the nucleus at fixed distances. So that would be a good representation of the Bohr model. Now this is not the current model of the atom, but a lot of times we use the Bohr model to help us understand um, you know, what's going on with the atom, even though it's not entirely accurate, it is very useful to help understand uh, what's taking place here. So this picture at the top, uh, they have the nucleus drawn really, really large. Uh, it wouldn't necessarily be that big, uh, but your protons and neutrons are in the center of the nucleus. It's positively charged. And then you have these electrons kind of orbiting the nucleus here uh, in specific areas, uh, circular orbits at fixed distances. So now this helps explain um, those chemical properties of the atom a little bit better. So we have to kind of take this idea with the Bohr model and take it a little bit further here now. So there's some more things we can learn from Bohr's model. Um, these orbits we talked about, they're referred to as energy levels. We use the letter N to denote energy levels here, and those are just those fixed distances, those fixed energies that an electron can have. We're going to talk more about energy levels as we move forward in the atoms unit, all right? But anytime you're thinking about energy levels, think about those orbits. Um, the basic gist here of how this all works, you have your positively charged nucleus in the center, and it's attracting those negative uh, electrons and keeping them in orbit. Otherwise, you know, the atom would kind of collapse on itself, uh, so there has to be this attraction um, to the nucleus, all right, so those negatively charged electrons are attracted to the nucleus. Uh, and then, like I said, we're, we're kind of able to explain the chemical properties here uh, with this model. So when electrons uh, absorb or emit energy, they can actually move between these energy levels. So if you want to get an electron uh, to go to a higher, higher orbit uh, to excite an electron, it, you have to give it energy. All right. So if you look over here at this picture, this is showing you a nice you know, model of the atom. You have your positive nucleus in the center. This electron is orbiting all right, the nucleus here. If you want that electron to get excited, you got to give it energy. So this electron gets energy. You can, you know, add electricity, burn it, and then it would jump to a higher energy level and have a larger orbit. It would have more energy. All right. And then to get it to return, it has to give off energy. 
All right? So just as fast as you give this electron energy and it jumps up to a higher energy level, it would fall back down and give off some of that energy. So we're going to talk more specifically about this, you know, jumping up, falling down uh, when we get to kind of the end of this unit. But you need to understand here that this is explaining the chemical properties of uh, the elements that the Rutherford model could not explain. So Bohr's model is definitely a better representation here of the atom, even though it's not perfect. So you definitely need to know that these orbits are referred to as energy levels, and we use the letter N to denote that. Sometimes it's helpful here to think of Bohr's models being like a ladder, okay? Every rung of the ladder is like one of those energy levels that you could find an electron in or one of their orbits. Um, so if you were at the very bottom and you weren't on any of the rungs, you'd be, you'd be at the nucleus here. And then the first step of the ladder, the first rung, would be like your first um, energy level, your first orbit, and then the second, third, so on. Uh, so think about these electrons as if you were climbing a ladder. If you were on the first step, if you have the right amount of energy, you could make it up to the second step. But you couldn't, you know, stop and hover in between the steps. Same thing for electrons. If they have enough energy, they can get excited and go to the second or the third or fourth. But they can't, you know, hover in between levels. They need the right amount of energy here to be able to get to the next energy level. Uh, but this idea of the ladder is a good idea, but it, it's not entirely accurate here, all right? The levels, uh, these orbits, are not actually equally spaced apart. So a, a representation here where the, the ladder is, you know, all even is not accurate. And just realize here that as you go from the first to the second to the third, as you go kind of up the ladder, you would need more energy as you went up. Okay, you'd be at the lowest energy at the bottom, and you'd be at the highest energy at the top. You've got to have more energy to be able to climb it. So this is not a perfect representation of Bohr's model, as you'll see. In reality here, the higher energy levels are actually closer together, so it takes less energy when you're closer uh, to the top of the ladder to move between the steps, between the rungs. So this ladder here, with un equally spaced rungs is actually a better representation of the Bohr model. Uh, so at the bottom, if you're in the first energy level, it takes a lot more energy to go to the second than it does to go from the second to the third and so on. So actually, as you go up the ladder, the energy levels uh, get closer together here. So when you're drawing it, you don't have to necessarily draw it like that with the spacing, but understand that they're not equally spaced apart. That would be a better representation of Bohr's model. So even though we use the Bohr model here a lot to represent atoms because it really does help us understand where things are located and what's going on in the atom, uh, technically this model only works for really, really small atoms. Uh, but what's interesting is there's an equation here where you can calculate the energy absorbed or emitted by an electron as it moves between these different levels here. All right, so here's this equation. All right, the good news is you do not need to memorize it. You'd always be given this equation, and you just need to be able to use it. And I'll show you a problem in a second. Uh, but delta E here stands for the change in energy, because that's what you'd be calculating. You're trying to find the change in energy here. All right, so you have this constant here in joules. Realize if we're calculating the change in energy, your unit is going to be joules for your answer. People always forget the units for this. And then... You have this part here, which is 1 over n squared final minus 1 over n squared initial. So basically, in these problems, a lot of times, you're given an initial and a final energy level. Remember, n stands for an energy level. Uh, and you have to plug this in correctly. You have to read the problem and make sure you're using the correct final and the correct initial. Uh, but the good news is you are given the equation. You just have to do the math correctly on your calculator and then calculate uh, the change in energy here. So we're going to look at an example of this and try one. So here's an example of one of these problems. You can see the equation is given at the top. Remember, I would always give you this equation on a test, quiz, whatever. You, you would always have it. You don't need to memorize it. You just need to be able to use it. So this problem says, what is the energy of a photon when an electron moves from n equals 3 to n equals 1? So it's going from energy level 3 to energy level one. And then there's a follow-up question, is the energy absorbed or emitted? 
So we're calculating the energy, the delta E. So we're just going to start using our equation here. Delta E equals negative 2.18 times 10 to the negative 18th joules. Okay. And then this is where you're plugging in. 1 over n squared final. So 1 over um, n squared final. What is the final n here? You have two n's. All right. And this is where you got to read the problem. So if you look at the problem, you're going from n equals 3 to n equals 1. So you're ending in n equals 1. All right. So your n squared final is going to be 1 squared. Well, 1 squared is just 1. So I'll write it, write it as 1 squared, but realize it's just 1, okay? Minus 1 over n squared initial. Well, you're starting in n equals 3, and you're going to 1. So your initial n is 3. So 1 over uh, n squared initial would be 1 over 3 squared, which is 1 over 9, okay? So the hardest part here for people is plugging this in the calculator correctly. So realize, essentially what you're going to have here in the parentheses, you're going to have 1 minus 1 over 9. So just be careful when you're plugging this in. Uh, if you do 1 minus 1 over 9, your 1 over 9 needs to be in parentheses. So you can do 1 minus 1 divided by 9 in parentheses, hit equals, multiply that by this negative 2.18 times 10 to the negative 18th number, and then you should get hopefully the correct answer here. So we don't necessarily worry about sig figs for these problems because this negative 2.18 number has two decimal places. I usually just round these to two decimal places. So when I plug and chug this, I get negative 1.94 times 10 to the negative 18th. And remember, you're finding the change in energy. The only unit you had here was joules, okay? So don't forget your units, all right? Pay attention to how you're plugging this in the calculator. So that would be the correct answer here. So it's not too bad if you know how to just plug into the equation and then put it in your calculator because you're given the equation. But then there's a follow-up question here. It says, is the energy absorbed or emitted? Okay, so this is where you can look at the sign. So anytime you have a negative change in energy, negative means the energy is exiting all right it was given off so this means the energy was emitted here all right so don't forget to answer these follow-up questions if the energy was positive that means you're taking in energy the energy would be absorbed all right you could think about it like this as well you're going from three to one so you're going from a higher energy to a lower energy so the only way you can go lower is if you give off energy all right. The only way you could fall back down to a lower energy level is if you gave off energy. So you could think about it like that as well. But the easiest way to do it is just look at the sign of the delta E. If it's negative, it's emitted. If it's positive, it's absorbed. So remember, you're always given this equation. You just need to be able to plug in and solve. So the last model of the atom we're going to look at is Schrodinger's model. Uh, this would be considered our current model of the atom today. And basically, it uses... Uh, this mathematical equation to talk about the probability of uh, where these electrons are located. So there's actually, you know, some very complicated math here, some quantum physics stuff. Uh, but the good news is you don't need to know the math or we're not doing any math with it. Uh, but you do need to understand what it looks like. So this is known as Schrodinger's model, the current model, the electron cloud model, or the quantum mechanical model of the atom. So you need to be familiar here with all of these names. So this one is a little tougher to draw, but uh, let's see what we come up with here. So just like we said before, once Rutherford discovered that nucleus, we know it's going to be there. So the our current thinking here of what the atom looks like, we know that there's a positive uh, nucleus in the center with the protons and the neutrons uh, inside. So we have that positive nucleus in the center. And the electrons are still outside of that nucleus, okay? It's just that they're not just moving every which way. They're not moving in specific orbits anymore. Uh, he used math here to talk about the probability of where an electron is located. So what you see here in this picture is this kind of shading, all right? You can see there's this darker shading, and then it kind of fades out. So this is this idea that darker regions are where you're more likely to find electrons 
and lighter regions are where you're less likely to find electrons. It's all probability based. So we don't know exactly where the electrons are located. We can only speak to it in terms of uh, probability and where we think they are located. So if you had to draw this one, okay, so you would draw your positive nucleus in the center, and then you have to kind of do some shading here. And it is a little bit tougher, but you try to show that, you know, there's some darker regions here right around the nucleus, and then it would kind of uh, fade out a little bit. All right, so if you were doing this, you would kind of show that like it got less, right? And you can even have some darker regions outside of that. So it's all this idea of, you know, probability here, uh, where an electron is going to be located. So your positive nucleus in the center with your protons and neutrons, your electrons are outside of that still. Uh, it's just that uh, we don't know exactly where they are. It's all probability based. The darker regions are where you're more likely to find electrons. So Make sure you know all the names associated with this model. Uh, we're going to talk about the electron cloud here uh, in a second, but it's the current model of the atom. It's our current thinking here of uh, the model of the atom, uh, and it was developed by Erwin Schrodinger. A little bit more here with Schrodinger's model, this electron cloud model. Uh, we already said the protons and neutrons are found in the center, in the nucleus, the positively charged nucleus, and then we have this electron cloud, which is just this picture of the probable locations of where you're likely to find electrons. All right. It's all probability based. We don't know exactly where they're at. Uh, we say that the darker regions or the denser regions in the picture are where you're more likely to find electrons. And then the lighter regions are where you're less likely to find electrons. But we don't know exactly where the electrons are. So this idea of um, the orbits with Bohr's model, while it's a great idea, it definitely helps you understand how the atom is kind of set up. It's not technically uh, the current model of the atom. It's not technically correct, uh, but it definitely is used and people use the Bohr model to help explain uh, how things are kind of arranged in the atom, but it's not entirely perfect. All right. So darker regions are where you're more likely to find electrons here in Schrodinger's model of the atom. So you should be familiar with all the models of the atom and be able to draw them and explain them.